few words about androgenic alopecia. Well, with androgenic alopecia, we have this problem. There are many mimickers of androgenic alopecia, and again, taking into consideration which of these patients may have female androgenic alopecia, well, the answer you can suspect already, the answer is none. None of these patients has androgenic alopecia, even though they may look like androgenic alopecia. So how do we identify androgenic alopecia with trichoscopy? Well, what is the most important is to know that, again, androgenic alopecia is not a disease of hair falling out. It's a disease of hair follicle miniaturization. So the hair follicle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and it will produce hairs which are shorter and thinner, shorter and thinner, and so on. And the smallest hairs are the vellus hairs. They are three millimeters high. They have less than 30 micrometers in thickness, and they are hypopigmented. So clinically, they will not be visible. And what is um, important from the perspective of trichoscopy is that this process is not synchronized, meaning that we will have some hair which are in the late phase of the process of miniaturization, some which are in the middle phase, and some which are in the very beginning, and they are still looking normal. So this will be reflected in trichoscopy because we will have a high hair shaft thickness heterogeneity, and this is the most important trichoscopy feature of androgenic alopecia. If we do not have hair thickness heterogeneity, this is not androgenic alopecia. And again, here we will have some hairs which are thick, some which are intermediate, some which are thin, and the very, very thin vellus hairs which are close to invisible. We may go on with talking about trichoscopy, but today I would like to share with you some other information. For those of you who are specifically interested, I made a short video on YouTube about the trichoscopy sites uh, of androgenic alopecia, including their clinical significance. Few words about the treatment of androgenic alopecia. Regarding the treatment, what I start with, I ask the patient whether he or she is smoking. The reason is because smoking is associated with increased prevalence and faster progression of androgenic alopecia. So this is for me an important factor to consider before I start pharmacotherapy. Regarding pharmacotherapy, I'm showing you one of the newest recommendations. These are the recommendations of our society. That they indicate starting with minoxidil, either topical or uh, oral, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, and we should start with finasteride, both in the women and in men. In the women, it is off-label. In men, it is approved. And in men, the approved dose is one milligram per day. And in the women, we use a higher dose. If it is not effective or we want to switch, we switch to dutasteride. Definitely, dutasteride is more effective than finasteride in the treatment of androgenic alopecia. Why do we start with finasteride then? Well, one of the reasons is because it is approved for hair loss. Second reason is because finasteride has a significantly shorter health life. Another important information is that the efficacy of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors is highest in the younger age. So the best candidates for 5 alpha reductase inhibitors for finasteride and dutasterides are women below the age of 50 and men below the age of 40. It will work in patients who are older, but the efficacy will be not so significant. And what is important to remember regarding women is that these two drugs are teratogenic. They cause an inhibition of the development of male sexual organs if the woman is taking these uh, medications during pregnancy. My approach on contraception for women is for one month after discontinuation of finasteride and six months after dutasteride. The background for this is the half-life and also the FDA recommendation for blood donors. Of course, there are no official recommendations because this is an off-label treatment. I was asked yesterday about the sexual adverse events with finasteride and dutasteride. There is some, however, minor risk of adverse events in patients who are taking finasteride. In patients who are taking dutasteride, it seems that this is not statistically significant. What uh, may be of some importance is that the risk 
of sexual adverse events in patients who are taking these medications is increased, in patients who are obese, who are smoking, who have diabetes, who have hypertension, but also in those who have anxiety disorders. What is new, maybe not very new, is the low-dose oral minoxidil. There is no tablet to cover this. So if we want a dose of 0.25 milligram, then we will need to uh, cut the tablet into pieces, and definitely this will be very far from accurate. So most of us prefer the compound product, which is made by the pharmacist.